Welcome to the political segment of the Weekend Show, where we will be discussing the current state of affairs and the challenges facing the economy with the Nigerian senator who represented the Kaduna Central District in the 8th National Assembly, Senator Shehu Sani. Good morning, sir, and thank you so much for joining us. Good. Thank you for having me in your program. Yes. Um, let's start with your journey. You know, reflecting on your political journey, what exactly motivated you to join politics here in Nigeria? Uh, well, first of all, uh, by history and by interest, I have been an activist, uh, a civil rights activist, uh, one that uh, for over four decades have been involved in uh, activism, particularly during the era of military rule when we were struggling to this lodge the military and restore democratic order in Nigeria. And it all began from student activism, then to civil rights activism. And then the break was the time when many of us went to prison uh, during the era of the military. So I spent four years in prison. And uh, with the advent of democracy in 1999, we were released and uh, we at that time made a mistake of not joining the transition program in 1999. But later we joined politics and I was in the Alliance for Democracy and later the uh, CPC and then the AC, uh, APC. So that has been the journey. So it was activism uh, from the beginning and later I joined politics and I contested election. Twice I lost, and the, on the third attempt, I won the senatorial seat. Okay, lovely. Um, thank you so much for your activism in shaping, you know, Nigeria so far. Uh, how do you perceive the current state of affairs in the country right now, and uh, particularly when it comes to social stability and governance? Yeah, if you are going to objectively, fairly, and uh, intelligently analyze or assess the situation in Nigeria today. Uh, we need to look at it within the context of where we are coming from and where we are and possibly where we're heading to. Okay. Um, from, two, from 1999 uh, to 2015, there was one dominant political party in power, which was the PDP. And within that period, we had three governments of Abbasanjo, Eradua, Jonathan Goodluck. And Nigerians, uh, for the first time in history, an opposition party took over power. So when Nigerians came out in mass uh, and voted for Buhari, it means that they were disappointed and disenchanted with the leadership and the system from 1999 to 2015. So there were so much hopes and expectations from Nigerians that the new leadership will deliver on good governance, deliver on economy, deliver on security, and deliver on all aspects of life. This is one of the most important countries in Africa, uh, if not the most important country, and in the whole of the black race, you don't have a nation as populous as ours. And not just in population, but we are blessed with everything. So we, 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 what we need, just like Chino Achebe said in his trouble with Nigeria, about leadership, we are still in that search mm. of a leader who will deliver us out of the wood and take us to the promised land. That led to 2015. But from 2015 to 2023, we have seen how the country was systematically destroyed. Uh, the, our hopes were dashed, our expectations were not met. Nigerians became more beleaguered and bewildered for the eight years of Buhari administration. And um, he came with the mantra or toga of integrity. But if you, Nigerians have now come to realize that leadership is not simply about the integrity and honesty of a leader, but it's also about delivery, about vision about being able to stand up to challenges and, and, and do a lot of things. So uh, it's still the same ruling party that is in power today. 
the person who happens to be in the position of authority now has distanced himself from what has happened. Of course, mm. he wasn't holding any position of authority. Okay. And now he came up not with the strategy of, of continuing, even if during, during the campaign, they say they were continuing with the policies and program of, uh, at the administration of Buhari. But when he took over, it is obvious and clear that it's not, he is not continuing. So he admitted that he is implementing reforms and they are going to come with pains. And for any student of history or any person who has been following political events in the world, and he will be a political or economic theorist, you know that when you are implementing fundamental economic reforms, they come with a lot of challenges and pains. If you remember, uh, when Deng Xiaoping took over power after the death of Chairman Mao, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, of China is credited for implementing reforms that brought China to where it is today. And it came with a lot of pains, a lot of hardship, a lot of suffering. The same thing with Margaret Thatcher when she took over power in 1979. She is on the right side of the economic divide, but she did that. Uh, in Brazil, in, in, uh, in Indonesia, under Sokhano, and then Mahathir Mohammed in, in, uh, in Malaysia. And we have seen Lin Kuan Yew, the same thing in Singapore. So uh, you can assess a reform when it is, when people are suffering, when there is so much hardship, then you can only assess it if at the end of the day, it has not delivered all its goals. Uh, it's like when you're building a site, building, having a new building, and then you can't assess the beauty of a building when it's simply a construction site. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much dust, so much water splashed everywhere, people are moving, I mean, things are scrolled. So, uh, for now, uh, people, there is no way the government can be popular in the hearts of people when it is implementing a reform where people are suffering. But there will be a reversal if in the next 12 or 15 or 20 months, people have now seen that the seed that was planted, that was watered, that was cultivated, has now started bearing fruit. So there is no leader in the world that will implement a reform and be popular. And this is what is happening to this government. So if we are going to assess it now, it's a fact. People are suffering. They can't pay their rent. They can't feed themselves. They can't pay the school fees of their children. They are finding it difficult to, to transport themselves from one place to another. But this is where we are today. So if these sacrifices made by Nigerians and the suffering now, at the end of the bear fruit, then everyone will say that it is worth it. But if at the end uh, it is simply a sentence that we moved from bad to worse situation, then it's not going to be good for the government itself. Mm. Although you've touched briefly on it, my next question is uh, your assessment of the past one year of President Tinubu in office. Because I saw a recent interview you did where you um, appealed to Mr. President that he shouldn't make similar mistakes like his predecessor. And uh, particularly with nepotism, incompetence, uh, those were the words he used, in governance, security, and economic issues. I would like to hear more on that. Yeah. Uh, well, in every leader, you will have um, some successes and failures yeah. and challenges. Even those of us who have been critical of Buhari administration, um, we will not shy away from the fact that there are areas which he has also met some success. Uh, but in the case of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, which you are making a reference to, I will say that um, he came into office and met subsidy withdrawn. Mm. Uh, the mistakes that were made was that there was no anticipation of the hardship and suffering which people are going to experience. And for that reason, there could have been a serious 
investment in terms of reducing the effect of this withdrawal. There was none. So it's like now we jump, the regime or the government jumped into fire and it was looking for a extinguisher to kill. So we, we found ourselves in a situation where all our lives for four to five decades we have been used to subsidy and then we woke up there is no subsidy. And then there is hunger, there is suffering, there is hardship everywhere. Yeah. And now people are thinking of what to do. Uh, is it buying food to share to people? Is it sending handouts to people? Is it crediting accounts of people with some pittance? Or what do we do actually? So this is where we for, for the government for, for found itself. The successes uh, could be in form of some aspect of the reforms. All our lives we have been defending subsidy as an activist and labor union and many of us. But we went to the street in protest. Since during the Babangida regime, we have been protesting against subsidy any increment, even if it's one era. Sometimes we look back and I see all these videos mm -hmm. and photos of protests we did because one naira or two naira is added. And now we are paying a litre for family. I didn't try to find it difficult to even defend the situation which we are in now. But the point is that um, subsidy as it is, no country in the world that doesn't subsidize. But before you subsidize, you must have the money to subsidize. And a situation where subsidy move from millions to billions to trillions and then we have to borrow to subsidize and there will be a time we cannot subsidize so we find a find solutions to it so we can account some successes uh, in this way first of all i'm highly impressed by the action of mr president when he was he has now embarked on granting financial autonomy to local governments local governments have been uh, under the two. There is virtually no local government in Nigeria. Their money was taken, has always been taken over by governors. And uh, they simply exist in name and on paper, and they don't exist. So he has taken action on that aspect of it. And then on security issues, I come from a northern part of the country where security challenges is at its peak. Uh, for you to know that I come from Kaduna State and uh, kidnapping of people, uh, the killing of people by bandits and terrorists has been with us for a very long time. Uh, a part of our state in the central, like Bindengwari, Giwa, and Igabi local governments, are under consistent attacks by terrorists and bandits. In southern Kaduna, it has been a disaster where terrorists go in, kill people, raise a whole village, pick hostages, rape women, and do what they want to do. We have been on through this for the whole of Buhari administration. It is going on in a lesser scale now because we have seen that some top leaders of these terrorists have been eliminated and then some of these bandits, their leaders too, have been killed. And you know that in the last three to four years, you can't just move from Kaduna to Abuja yeah. by road. Kidnapping and killing is almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But now people are moving. In the last one year, you have, you have two incidents of this kidnapping there. And the train attack that happened. Yeah. And in my state, uh, when I'm talking, I'm talking of relative achievement and progress we made. I'm not in the business of holding forth for the government. But I make comparison. For example, I come from a state where for years, our schools have been unsafe. For a whole one year now, it's only Kuriga Primary School in Chukuloka government that was attacked and the students were kidnapped. And then with the effort of the governor of the state, mm -hmm. Ubasani, and national security advisor and other defense chief, they were able to rescue them within some few days. This is unheard of. In the past, uh, under Buhari, the girls of federal government college Federal Government Girls College Yawuri were in the hands of terrorists for almost two years. You can see attack in Government Secondary School in Angara, uh, School of Agri Mechanization Kaduna, Greenfield University Kaduna, Bethel Baptist High School Kaduna, Government Science College Kagara, Sangaya School in Tegina, Government Secondary School Jengibi. You can see count on and on that kidnapping and attack on schools was almost a daily affair. Yeah. But now you can see some 
appreciable level of progress we made. So from the era of, from the area of security, you can see some major of success which have been. And the mistake that we have always made in this country is that each time one of our own, when I say one of our own, I mean the person who is in the, on the saddle of leadership happens to be either from our ethnic group or from a section of the country or from our, our religious affiliation. We seem to always uh, think of him as faultless, as one who is infallible, one whom we should support. So for eight years of Buhari administration, the mistake uh, many made, especially from my own part of the country, is that there was such a solidarity for Buhari, support for Buhari, to the point that it's like a blasphemy for you to criticize him. It's like a blasphemy for you to even advise him. The issue that he's our own and we should support him and we should defend him. And now the section of our own country was suffering. When I was in the National Assembly, uh, especially in the, in the Senate, at Senate, I consistently make sure that I raise my hand and attract the attention of Saraki to give me an opportunity to speak on the killings of my people by bandits. But you know what? Many of our senators from the north were not happy with me. That it's as if I am rubbishing or tarnishing the image of Buhari. So I said, should we be more interested in defending or protecting the image of Buhari when our people are, are killed? Mm -hmm. So when people from the north they have the right to hold President Tinubu accountable for their security. But the moral burden on it is that you cannot keep quiet when your own was in power and your people are killed by terrorists and now said you want to make noise. You have the right. Democracy gives you the right. But from the moral side, you can see the deficit. You can see the discrimination in terms of selecting whom we shall be angry with and whom we should be silent with. So. In that aspect, this is the situation which we find ourselves. And then I said, uh, what was the point you raised about uh, uh, that I said of recent? Okay, yeah, I said in a recent interview, you stated that Mr. President should have made similar mistakes like his predecessor. Yeah. Um, under Buhari, there were a lot of mistakes that were made, and one of which was so apparent, uh, keeping political appointees in power, in office, mm -hmm. or the seat beyond their own relevance. You have people holding position of authority and they are not performing and then you keep them for whole eight years and then sometimes head of MDAs will be in office and then you keep extending their, their tenure in office when they should have gone. We have seen how what happened on that board? One person will hold one ministry for eight years. And I wonder, and I ask question, I see Buhari doesn't know anybody in the country. From all, most of the key ministries on that Buhari were held by one person for eight years. There is no cabinet reshuffle, no assessment of performance as it's done by this administration. Nothing. He just kept a person there. And you ask yourself, uh, in a nation of 220 million people, as if you don't have anybody, you only have that person. That is one. Take, for example, what happened during the, the era of, uh, of, of the issue of the service chiefs or the Buhari. Mm. Uh, the service chiefs were kept at a time when farmers were slaughtered, students were kidnapped, villages were raised in northern Nigeria. And most of the security, all the security apparatus in Nigeria was held by northerners. And then you keep these people. And then when their tenure elapsed, you extend it by two years. And then when they are done with the two years, when they, when they exhausted the two years, you extend it by one year. And when they exhausted the one year, you extend it by six months. When they exhausted it, you extend it by two months. Now, this is, was how he led his government for, for, for the fact that the people come from his own part of the country. President Tunubu will be making a fundamental mistake if you thread on that path of appointing people for ethnic reasons, for regional reasons, for sectional reasons. 
If you are appointing people into office because they come from the southwest, if you are appointing people into office because they are Yoruba, if that is the only qualification you have, then you will be following the path of Buhari. Mm -hmm. Nepotism was at its highest peak under Buhari. And if that now is the path which Tunubu has taken, then he is going to kiss the dust if he is not careful. But I can see um, the person in power here is from the southwest and part of Nigeria. But so glad there are key ministries we see that are of relevance to northern Nigeria. When you talk of education, the north is lagging behind the Minister of Education is from the north. The issue of security is still in, in the hands of northerners because of Ribadu is in charge. Yeah. You see agriculture, which the north has pride itself, is also in the hands of uh, northerners. Mm -hmm. And even the Secretary of the Government of Federation from the north central part of Nigeria. So there are key ministries to which the north as, uh, as uh, is still in charge. But I can see that uh, the path which Buhari took now led him to placing people who have only two credentials. One is uh, deceptive loyalty, and second is simply about their ethnic and religious identity or affiliation. And that stuck the government in one place and led it to where it became at the end of the day. Mm. Um, earlier, you mentioned the labor unions. As an activist, I would like to hear your thoughts on this topic of the minimum wage. Um, I understand the NLC and the TUC uh, came down a bit to a little over 200,000, the federal government 62,000, and state governments 50,000. I would like to hear um, your thoughts on this minimum wage topic. You see, one reason why. Um, government policies and programs and pronouncements are not believed by people is that they see the sacrifices being made as one side. If a nation is undergoing serious and fundamental economic reforms, then sacrifices should be across board. As the poor are sacrificing, the rich will also be making sacrifice. As the subjects are sacrificing, making sacrifices, the king was also make sacrifice. As those in the lower strata, the downtrodden are making sacrifices, the bourgeoisie class must make sacrifices. But that is not the case. When you have lawmakers are disrespectful of the situation which the people of the country are undergoing mm -hmm. and are still thinking of living a life of luxury, you know, nobody is going to believe you. So, um, if you look at the current reality of Nigeria today, even if you are paid 200,000, it's not going to be enough for you to address your issues. Wear, wear a bag of, wear a, a basket of tomato uh, rose to about 120,000 and a bag of rice is between 70 to 80,000. Um, in food alone, you are most likely going to spend almost about 80% of everything you have. And then when you talk of rent, when you talk of school fees, we grew up in, in Nigeria where our parents never suffered for the payment of school fees. Mm -hmm. We attended public primary school, public secondary school, and public tertiary institutions. And they never bothered about our fees because it was as good as nothing was given to us. I can remember, I, I, my alma mater was Government Science College Kagara in Niger State. Uh, and I can tell you that in the early 80s, uh, people are even given money to transport themselves back to their homes. The school gives you money, depend on your distance. If you come from uh, if you come from Sokoto, if you come from Calabar, what you write there, you'll be given transport money. In our school, it was a public school. We were fed with eggs, we were given even oranges and banana. We are given everything we need. And the, the school fees was almost nothing. But, but in the present world, uh, the, those, those institutions have been destroyed over the years. Our subsequent Nigerian leaders were not able to keep faith. With, uh, uh, with maintaining the, the, the standard of public schools. Uh, 
the schools we attended today, we can't take our children to such kind of schools. So, mm -hmm. so, so this is what happened. So 200,000 Naira as minimum wage is even not enough for, for, for a typical Nigerian to, to survive. Knowing how, by the fact that uh, poor people have the highest number of children, in most cases, uh, you find them, uh, you have to pay your rent, you have to pay your electricity bill, you have to transport yourself, you have to transport your children to, to work, you have to, to, to their school, you have to feed, and you still have. We are not a European society, we are an African society. You don't live only with you and your wife. Your wife have relations, you have relations, you have dependents, there are orphans, there are so many things. So how do you survive by trunch children? But the issue is this, that uh, government can only pay what is available, what they can pay. Uh, if you make promises of being able to give a minimum wage to 150,000 Naira, then at the end of the day, government have to be printing money every month to pay salary. We are serving one problem and creating another. Okay. So that is why I am of the belief that within, if some state governments could have dared to say they want to pay 70,000, some 65,000, I think the, the federal government should be generous enough uh, to raise the bar. Uh, they shouldn't make false promises of things they cannot pay, but they should also be considerate on the situation. And, um, the minimum wage is more important than the maximum wage because almost about 60% of people who are working are within that range. But what I want also Nigerians to understand is that even if you are not working, you should be concerned about the minimum wage. Because if you are simply a trader and you have a boy working in your shop, if the federal government said the minimum is 200,000, you should know that you have to pay him 200,000. Yes. If you are a trader and you have a security man in your house, or if you are a teacher, you have to pay 200,000 at minimum wage. So minimum wage is not simply about staffs of the federal government, civil service in the states and local government, but it's about a law for the whole country. Your housemate, that girl who is working for you, you have to pay her 200,000 naira. That security man, you have to pay him 200,000 naira. That lady working in your saloon, you have to pay her 200,000 naira. So when they say minimum wage, is about looking at the situation of the economy of the country, in the country, and see how, what you can afford. If you have a driver and he's working for you, you can't pay him anything less than what the country says is minimum wage. So it affects everybody. So uh, for me, I believe that the negotiation should, should continue and we reach a point whereby the labor will make sacrifices and the government will make sacrifices and then they meet at a certain point, which we will now say, this is the amount of money we can pay. Nigeria is not simply a country for civil servants. It's a country for all kind of people. We are a third world nation. I think this is something we always need to remind ourselves. Because this idea we are an oil producing nation, we are a rich country, we have a lot of money, we have a lot of I think we should come down from that high horse and tell ourselves the truth. So minimum wage should be something that the government can afford and which the labor can now see that uh, there, is, there is not enough money to solve all problems of the world. Uh, like I was said, more money, more problems. If, you're, if your minimum wage is raised to one million naira, you should know that that lady is selling food in the market. She knows you are paid. She will naturally jack up the price. So that is it. Sure. Mm. Um, how can young Nigerians now, you know, be encouraged to join politics today, particularly seeing the state of governance? Um, well, you see, we joined politics when we were younger. And the reasons for joining politics, and most of people who are now holding political office joined politics when they were younger. And many joined politics when they were in their twenties, some thirties. And so it's not that uh, they joined politics as elders. So if you are a young man and you are desirous of changing your country, it's not possible to achieve that really by 
merely posting messages on social media. Uh, it has been said that politics is dirty, but you have to get into that dirty field in order to clean the country. If you are a young man and you switch on your handsets and see the beauty of Switzerland, the beauty of Japan, the beauty of Brazil, the beauty of, of, of Canada, and you want to go there, and, and the, 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 what should uh, struck your head is that that is the hard work of some people. Uh, some people s suffered, make sacrifices to build their country. So you can't make any significant change in your country, you can't make any serious impact in your country without getting politically involved. Policies supersede everything. Today, they have set up, from yesterday, was it? they have set up um, a presidential economic coordinating council, but you can see Dangote and Illumilu are there. So, but when you talk to them, they will say they are businessmen, but they find themselves <laughs> deep into, into politics. Because politics determine businesses, politics determine economy, politics determine so many things. This is the way we live. So young people should be inspired uh, by the fact that it is achievable. There is no power that will be given to you freely. You have to struggle for it. You have to understand the system and get through it. Today in Senegal, a 44-year-old man is the president of the country. And young people in Nigeria have the numbers, but many of them prefer to serve politicians who are elders in the country. They have the numbers. I don't see any reason why uh, young people will not sponsor a candidate and say that all of us are going to vote for this person because he's young, he has brilliant and fresh ideas. Um, not just those who are in their 70s and 80s, but Nigeria has one of the most resourceful, energetic, creative, and innovative younger generation. The Gen Z are full of ideas and they're making a lot for our country. You can see that from 1970 to 1999, uh, how many Nigerian musicians were able to win the Grammy? Uh, and as was Nigeria known, we were known musically in, with, because of our own uh, musical hero fella and yeah. few others. But today, Nigeria is making waves all over. I feel highly elated and proud to see an arena filled up in London because of Bonaboy, because of Tiwa Savage, because of Thames, uh, because of Ira Star. They are there. When you see them, these were not people that were known in the, 70s, in, the in the 90s. But today, they have dominated the, the, the entertainment industry uh, in Africa. And they are doing more than what the government is doing in terms of promoting the image of the country. In terms of sports, you can see how Osimen and so many are, are making a lot of ways for the country. Yeah. So that creativity, that innovation, uh, should be, should be consolidated into politics to take over political power. And you can see David O. Now, he's known all over, and he's a Nigerian. Everyone said this is, each time you see him, wherever you go in the world, in any part of the world, you feel proud that this is someone whom, with somebody. So that creative energy should be taken to taking over political power. Yeah. They should move into political parties, contest election at all level, and take over offices. <coughs> Some of us, when we were younger, we, when we came out of prison in 1998-99, we are still within that Aluta spirit. And while the politicians were holding meetings, con reaching out to the military to hand over power to them, and then dividing themselves into political parties, mm -hmm. APP, AD, uh, APP, uh, PDP, at that time, for those of us who were younger, we were simply, we simply want to fight. So we were there trying to fight, 
when the nation was transiting to the democracy. And before we realize it, they have taken over all political power. In 1999, when we came out of prison, um, we had a meeting, all of us, the right activists, most of us who were in the front line in the struggle at that time. Yeah. And General Abu Salam Abu Bakr repeatedly sent messages. He said he wanted to meet with us, but we are so hot-headed at that time. We said we don't want to see him. Just like the way the NSAS generation yes. confronted the Buhari and we said, that's what we did at that time. We said we don't want to see him. Uh, he begged to see us. We said we don't want to see him. At the end of the day, we gave him the audience. He said he wants us to organize them ourselves and take over power, that he's not interested in going beyond 1998. And then after a lot of, we beat the table and say, Bosa, Bosa, we, the activists of Nigeria, we will not accept the military transition. These are our conditions. This are, we, we started laying impossible conditions. We want government of national unity. We want a, a, a national conference, a very national conference. We want all those things here. While we are giving him impossible demands, politicians were assembling this. It was at that time, at that our meeting, the person who is the president of the Ebola team, he stood up. Ghani, Ghani was opposed to us joining the transition. Then, Tunubu at that time, before becoming a governor, he stood up and said, if we don't join this political transition, we're making a tragic mistake. The politicians will take over. He said, if I, didn't, if, I don't go to, if I don't join politics, who's going to take over Lagos? That's what he said. He said, do we continue to be on the street? When we fought, we won. The ANC in South Africa are supposed to have been our own guide. They were a liberation movement. They have the encounter Sizwe that was in the bush, fighting the apartheid uh, government, and they have the ANC. And then when FW de Clark extended the hands of friendship, Mandela was released. They trans transformed from a liberation movement to a political party and take over political power. We made that mistake and we didn't do what we need to do. It was four years after. Now we now start to realize our mistakes. Then we started getting into the politics, and at that time, all the spaces were taken over. Uh, Olisa tried to become president. Ghani tried to become president. Falana tried to become governor. I tried to become senator. Obasani, who is a governor, tried to become member of House of Reps. All of us, we were all, we lost. So that was our history. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much for that response. Yes. And um, I hope a lot of young people could support each other, finance the movement, and eventually join politics to make change. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Shosani, for an insightful conversation. We hope to have you back uh, to talk more on the state of governance and Nigeria in general, and of course, your past as an activist and where you're um, moving forward to and your changes to come. Thank you very much.